How's it going, Portland? Nice little town you got here. It smells like goats. Um, so check this out. I had some time this afternoon. Is Dan Saffer here? Yeah, it was during your talk. Uh, anyway, went to the record store. Check this out. Dirty Mind on vinyl, sealed. Yeah. You know what else I got? Charles Bradley. Who likes Charles Bradley? Who's Charles? Where are my Charles Bradley fans at? Come on, stand up. Let's hear it. And you know what? Then I find out when I'm paying for it, the person at the counter goes, oh, you know, he's playing tonight, right? Boom, I got tickets. So I'm going to go see Charles Bradley tonight. Where are my designers at? Raise your hands. Come on. Where am I? Just, I cannot see with those things. Those are like the sun. All right. Who's one? Oh, I'm not going to raise my hand because I'm a UI expert. Or my credit or, or my business card says I'm an Imagineer. Where are my designers at? Let's hear it. All right. That's better. All right. So, yeah, my name is Mike Montero. I came up here from San Francisco, like uh, the rest of your town did, driving your rents up. You're welcome. <laughs> We've destroyed two cities. Isn't that great? Um, I run a small agency called Mule Design. We make things. And I come to you today bearing good news. I come to you today because, you know, you don't want to end the day on bad news. I come to you today bearing glorious, glorious, happy news. I have been to the mountain. I was up there, right up top. I was right on top of that mountain. I saw the future. I saw land covered in milk and honey, perfectly gridded out and using no more than two complementary typefaces. I have seen a land where design has taken its rightful place alongside the suits of business and the hoodies of engineering. I have seen a land where all of our hard work has paid off. I have seen a land where those who advocated for the importance of design can now cash the checks their mouths wrote. I have seen a land where those who fought valiantly for the importance of user experience can now take a deserved rest. I have seen a land where those who fought for a seat at the table are now seated at the head of the table where not too long ago that seat was denied to us. We did it. We have done it. We have convinced people through all of our hard work, through all of our labor, through all of our medium think pieces, that design is important. We've convinced people that design can be the difference between success and failure. So let's give ourselves a big round of applause. This is the golden age of design. Come on. Yeah. All right. And we're fucked. Oh, I was supposed to say screwed. We're all screwed. Designers are screwed. The companies who hire them are screwed. Most importantly, the people that we've come, that who have come to rely on us for the stuff that we do, for the stuff that we design, they're screwed. And they're screwed for two reasons. We're screwed because we've created a demand for something for which there is very little supply. We need more designers than we have both available to us now and in the pipeline. And two, we're digging that hole deeper every day. Because in our hour of need, we've started moving designers up the ladder before they're ready. And they're not sure how to integrate themselves into a process, especially when they're also being asked to define it. So we can't find enough of them, and we don't know how to work with them anyway. That's the problem. And it's a problem that we need to fix. And because designers are problem solvers, I am confident that we can fix this problem. 
Let's tackle it one piece at a time. Let's tackle it first by finding some designers. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine not too long ago, and he was in the position of having to hire 500 designers in three months' time. 500 designers in three months' time. And I said to him, I said, where the hell are you going to find 500 good designers? And he says, who said anything about good? <laughs> I'm just trying to find 500. <laughs> this is bulk buying design. A lot of companies now are hiring designers the same way that we got sea monkeys when we were kids. You get 500, you see who survives, your parents flush the rest, they tell you they buried them, they didn't. Same with your grandmother. <laughs> and then you talk your parents into buying 500 more. Now, there's a couple of problems with the sea monkey method though. One, this is a really shitty way to treat people. Now, I run a design shop, I hire designers. And when I hire them, I tell myself that I'm taking on the responsibility for their career, as well as exchanging money for labor. I feel responsible for helping those people who I hire get better at what they do. And when you're just pouring 500 people into a fish tank for the sake of meeting a hiring quota, you just turned one problem in the 500 problems. Because all of those people are looking to you on how to measure their success. Not to mention figuring out how they work together. That is funny, by the way. <laughs> God, what a fucking sardine factory. And you've probably, anybody here from General Assembly? <laughs> yeah, stop. And you've probably moved on to collecting your next batch of 500 designers, so you're not going to be there to help them. But Mike, weren't they supposed to teach these designers all of this shit in design school? You would hope so, right? Now design school, design school is a great place. It teaches you how to work with people on projects. However, all of the people that you're working with they're just like you. They're all designers. They all speak the same language. They all care about the same stuff. And all the projects that you work on are make-believe. Design schools teach you about aesthetics. They teach you theory. They teach you how to work the tools. And all those things are important. They teach you how to be a designer as long as everybody else in the world is a designer. But very few of them actually teach you how to work. They don't teach you how to talk to clients. They don't teach you how to present your work. They don't teach you how to tie business goals to decisions. They don't teach you how to read a client email, and they certainly don't teach you how to respond to a client email. And how many here have been in projects where that was the thing that screwed it? They don't teach you ethics. They don't teach you why you should or shouldn't do things. They don't teach you the skills that you need to pay off that giant pile of student loans that you're amassing by being there. And that is criminal. Yeah, I like that one too. Now some companies, some companies are beginning to understand they understand that when they hire 500 designers a year, fresh out of school, what they're hiring is fresh meat. Fresh meat that needs to be tenderized. Fresh meat that needs to be seasoned. Fresh meat that needs to be molded. Now surely, there is a quick moving, disruptive startup working on this problem, right? You bet your sweet ass there is. They're young, they're stealthy, they're disruptors, they're international business machines. 
This is my friend, Greg Story. Anybody here know Greg Story? All right. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of friends. <laughs> he owe you money too? So Greg, Greg works at IBM in Austin. Now, as you know, IBM is gigantic and they have a set way of doing things. And for the most part, it's worked fairly well for them. But when you think IBM, you don't really think good design, do you? But even IBM decided that they needed to step up their design game if they were going to compete. So among other people, they hired my friend Greg over here. Now, Greg, Greg is one of the best and most experienced designers I know. And IBM hired Greg to design designers. So what Greg does is he puts IBM's new designers through a 12-week boot camp. They do three projects in those 12 weeks. They do, a 12 week, they do two three-week projects, and then they do one six-week projects. And all of those projects are related to business problems that IBM is trying to solve. And, along, and they're working with actual IBM people while they're doing this. They're talking to, to the actual managers and engineers and all that. And along their way, they're taught things like how to present their work, how to reply to email correctly, and they learn you know, do, how to do things the IBM way. IBM is dealing with the shortage problem by training their own. They'll take the young kids that need the seasoning, and they season them. They augment their skill sets. They teach them how to succeed in the organization, and they give them all of the tools that they need to do well and to advance within the company. This is a pretty good onboarding process, and they're starting to see some real results from it. Now, obviously, this kind of solution, it takes money, it takes time, and it takes patience. IBM can do it. Google can do it. Apple can do it. Companies like that can do it, but not the smaller companies. Now, some of you here may run some of those smaller companies, and you're thinking, holy shit, I cannot take 12 weeks to train a designer, which is understandable. And some of you here may be some of those designers who came fresh out of school and got thrown into one and decided to go work at one of those companies with no training. I want to help both of you today. Mostly I want to help the two of you never meet. <laughs> because if you can't spare 12 weeks to train a designer, you have absolutely no business talking to a designer that needs 12 weeks of training. You're toxic to each other's success. Now, if I'm one of those companies that can't afford that kind of intense training, what am I supposed to do? And if I'm one of those designers just coming out of school, how the hell do I know where I'm supposed to work? Let me give you an example involving my mom. It's my mom. Hey, Henry. Hey, Henry. my son's here. Henry, look at grandma. This probably scares you a lot less than it scares me. By the way, this last Mother's Day, I sent her flowers. She calls me up. She says, you've sent better. <laughs> it's my mom. It's a lovely lady. My mom's a seamstress. My mom sews things for a living. She's done it her whole life. And she grew up. She grew up in a small town in Portugal. She's also an immigrant, like me. She grew up in the kind of town that's been doing things a certain way for a very long time. They're not going to change. So when my mom told my grandma that she wanted to be a seamstress, her mom did what mothers and fathers in that town had doing, been doing for generations on end. She took my mom to the town seamstress. 
And the town seamstress took my mom on as an apprentice. My mom spent years. <laughs> yeah, I like that one too. If that stays on screen for more than 20 seconds, I have to write Disney a really big check. So let's go. So my mom spent years learning her craft, not just the measuring and the cutting and the sewing, but also the client handling and the billing. She learned how to do a P&L statement. She learned how to talk somebody out of a dress that wasn't right for them in a gracious way. I think we have a plane landing in here. Yeah, that's great. And eventually, my mom rose up to the top of the apprentice ranks to the point where some of the customers would come in and they would ask for her by name. At which point the seamstress pulled a few cards out of a Rolodex. You can ask your parents what a Rolodex is. And she handed them to my mom and she said, here you go, Judy. My mom's name is Judy. Here you go, Judy. It's time to start your own shop. This is the apprenticeship model where someone skilled in the craft takes it upon themselves to train others. And if you're a young designer just starting out in your career, this is exactly what you should be looking for. Last year, I got together with some other old designers that I know, and I started a publication on Medium called Dear Design Student. Anybody here hear of it? All right, that's good. Now, the goal of this publication was to answer questions and to give advice to you know, young designers, kids coming out of school, that sort of thing. Having been around for a while, we've, we, you know, one, we like the sound of our own voice, and two, we thought we had good advice to give people, so we wanted to be there for them. We wanted to be there for the people who were coming up. We wanted to be good mentors. And one of the most popular questions that we get, what do I need to do to start my own studio? And the answer is always, wait 10 years. That's a really unpopular answer to a really popular question. Unfortunately, it's true. If you're just starting out in your career, and I'm sure you're incredibly talented, you're probably the best designer the world has ever seen. Just wait till they get a hold of you. But you have absolutely no idea how to do the job yet. You have no idea all of the things you don't know yet. You have a lot of learning to do, and the best thing that you can do is learn it on somebody else's dime. Find somebody who's been in this business for a long time. Find somebody who's already made all of the mistakes that you're about to make. Learn from them. Old people, God, we love telling stories. Nathan, Nathan is here. Nathan loves telling stories. You guys saw Draplin up here earlier. That guy's a storyteller. And Dan Saffer, he's like the oldest person I know. He loves telling stories. Find these old people. Listen to them. Because in these stories, you're going to find the secrets of being a designer. And while the technology behind how we do our jobs may change, and the devices that we design for may change, the core of what we do as designers hasn't changed in thousands and thousands and thousands of years. There is still a lot that you can learn from old people. This is really just me just trying not to have them put me in the woods when I'm old. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Andy. Now, Andy here showed up at our studio about a year ago, applying for an intern position. Now, he had one of the best portfolios 
I'd ever seen for a kid coming out of school. And I asked him, I said, Andy, I said, Andy, what are, you, what are you learning in school? And he tells me, he said, it's the usual stuff. It's learning how to use the tools. It's learning how to choose type. It's learning how to look like a designer. Nailed that. <laughs> and these are good things to learn. These are things that you have to know. They're also about half of the things that you need to know to be a designer. So I told him, I said, Andy, Andy, if you come work for me, I can teach you all the stuff you didn't learn in school. I can teach you how to present work effectively. I can teach you how to explain your decisions to clients. I can teach you which risks are worth taking. I can teach you how to design persuasive arguments. I can tell you when to fight for something and when to keep your mouth shut. And I told him all of these things are going to take time to learn. And I asked him for two years. And for the first year, Andy didn't get to lead any projects. He didn't present work. And honestly, he didn't make a lot of decisions at all. But he watched everybody else in the studio do those things. He'd come with me to client presentations and he'd sit there and take notes. And then after the presentation, we'd go back to the office and we would review all of his notes. And he would ask me, why did you say this? Why did you phrase it this way? And I would just sit there and answer all of those questions. And it was, it was really helpful for me too to have to answer all of those questions. Now recently, Andy did get to lead a project. And he got to present his work to a client. And we practiced what he was going to say before the presentation. And I helped him develop a narrative. I helped him come up with a story. And I watched, and he got up there. He got up there, and he was a little shaky. And for a second there, I, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, his little sea legs came up under him. And he remembered all of the stuff that we talked about. He remembered all of the things that he learned. And he nailed that thing. He nailed that presentation. Got us the goal that we needed that day. But here's the best thing about Andy. When he first got to us, he knew that there were things he didn't know. And he was willing to say that there are things I don't know. I know people who've been in this business for 10, 15, 20 years, and they're too stupid to admit when they don't know something. This kid, fresh out of school, had no problem doing it. And that's not because he lacked confidence. On the contrary, confidence is about being secure in the things that you do know and, and being humble enough to admit the things you don't and believe that you can. Now, I've also told Andy that the day he wants to leave, because let's face it, everybody who will ever work for you who is any good will leave. The day he wants to leave, I want him to tell me. I want him to tell me way ahead. I want him to tell me as soon as he gets an inkling. And I want him to tell me what kind of work he's looking for, where he wants to go. And I'm going to hook him up with people. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through my Rolodex, I'm going to find my contacts, and I'm going to help Andy get his next job the same way that that seamstress did with my mom, because that is how I think it should work. So, so if you're a young designer, this is the type of situation that you should be looking for. And if you're an experienced designer who's been around the block a few times, you need to be looking out for kids like this. You need to be helping us grow the next generation of designers. You need to be generous with all of the things you know. The same way that somebody was probably generous with you about all of the things that they knew. The history of, a, of design is a giant chain that spans time and you are but a tiny little link and you're going to rust out. And your job while you're here is to find the link that replaces you. So if you're a design studio or a company, a big company, a small company, it doesn't matter, 
You need to build the kind of environment where teaching is possible. So that's mentorship. We solve the problem of finding the designers by mentoring them. And we can do this, we can do this at big companies, like Greg Story is doing at IBM. And we can do this at small companies, like I'm doing at my little rinky-dink 12-person shop. This is a bet on the future. Yep. <clears throat> but why should I work for a crotchety old fart like you? When I got Twitter right down the street, and they're willing to pay me 250 grand just to be a little design plebe. This is a really good question. This is a fair question. You should get paid for what you do, and you should get paid as much as you can get paid for what you do. Let me ask you another question. Why are you doing this? What are you in this for? Are you looking to have a long, successful career as a designer? How far up that ladder do you want to go as a designer? How much of this is about craft? And how much of this is just about getting that paycheck? How good do you want to be? And what are the things that you want to get better at? Because I've heard a million stories from a million designers who've been stuck in those startup minds. And they go into a place where all of the designers they're going to work with have the same amount of experience. By the way, you can tell this isn't a Silicon Valley startup because there's women. Yeah, you can clap at that. Most sexist fucking industry in the world. So they go to a place where all of the designers have the same amount of experience. Maybe one of them's going to have been, been there for six months more than the other ones, more than you, which means he's making a little bit more money. And in a world where people are watching their burn rate, he's getting laid off first, which means he's not teaching you shit. Or, God, I love that episode. Or you may be the only designer on staff. How many people here are the only designer on staff? Yeah, y'all are screwed. <laughs> Which means you're either going to get talked, tacked onto the marketing team or you're going to get tacked onto the dev team, both of which are going to see you as some weird sort of other type and you're not helping the situation by walking around with panda hats on. <laughs> and they're just going to use you to meet whatever needs that they have. And since you just got out of school, you have no idea how to deal with this situation because you've never faced it before. But you're not going to have a voice at those places. So there's no one to learn from. And your growth gets stumped. And you might get better at doing the things that that company needs you to get better at. But you're not, never going to get better at your craft. So you need to find the kind of company where you can grow. And that mentor that we talked about, the one who's going to be an invaluable resource in helping you deal with all of these idiots that you have to work with on a daily basis. I'm sure all of you work with wonderful people. Not going to be there. And these new companies, these startups, they're making this shit up as they go. That is not a criticism, by the way. That is a fact. And that's, that's, I actually mean that as a positive. And there's a certain level of excitement in that. But you, who just got out of design school, and you're still, you're, you're, you're still uh, wearing your umbilical cord as a scarf, <laughs> you're not ready for that kind of chaos. You've got enough chaos just trying to figure out who you are. So before you go putting yourself in that kind of chaotic situation, you need to make sure that you're the one who can hold their shit together. That means somebody who has seen a lot of different types of shit and knows what to do when something goes crazy. That may be you one day, but that's not you yet. 
Now, am I telling you to avoid startups? No, not at all. I love startups. Great ideas come out of little startups. And I want to encourage you to work there when you are ready. Because I need you to be ready when you go to places like that. I need you to be ready to fight. I need you to be ready to advocate for good design. I need you to be ready to advocate for the well-being of your users. I am encouraging you to get the training that you need for the fight ahead of you. And I hate to tell you this, it saddens me to have to tell you this, but right now in the startup world, or at least the ones making the majority of the noise, half those people have their heads up their own ass and they don't realize it stinks. They are solving problems for the top 5% of the population. Where in San Francisco can I take a nap during the day? <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Just fuck you. How can I make sure I'm not renting to unattractive people? Or egads, blacks. This is new from today. So Airbnb is about to get hit with a lawsuit uh, because nobody, uh, b because somebody who was uh, uh, applying to get uh, apartments there was constantly getting turned down until he created a profile with a white profile picture. How can I get poor people to do my chores? You know, I've got a stupid little dog, and I can tell you that the last thing in the world need, my dog needs is help getting laid. <laughs> he actually doesn't even need, like to be reminded of that since I took his little testicles away. <laughs> we need to be solving better problems than this. We need to fight. We need to learn how to design persuasive arguments to keep shit like this from seeing the light of day. We have more resources available to us now than at any time in the planet's history. Look what we fucking made. <laughs> we need to be the people in the room who says you can't put people's place of employment in their Tinder profiles. This is what happens when your entire team is, a, is made of white dudes. We need to be the people who design the kind of systems where shit like this isn't tolerated. These are not easy fights to have. These are difficult fights, and they are worthy fights, and they are necessary fights, and they are fights that designers need to be trained for. And part of the reason that shit like this is seeing the light of day is because they're being worked on by people who have never had to have this fight. They don't know how to have it. They haven't been trained for it. This is indeed the golden age of design, which means it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to make our presence felt. It's an opportunity to design the world the way it should work. A world where all of us have equal opportunity, where those who are doing well can help other people do well. This is an opportunity to discover your voice. This is an opportunity to use your voice. Design fucking matters. And it's up to you, it's up to you to decide how you want to use that voice. Do you want to use it to keep making crap like that? Do you want to use it to help keep making frat boys richer? Or do you want to use it to help build a more just world? As 
a newly minted designer, I want you, I want you to consider using your skills for the betterment of society. Go find some real problems to solve. I made you a handy list. You can work on any of this. This shit is hard and this shit is necessary. But look, we have enough problems that we need to solve. Oh, and by the way, if you need a timer on this, Greenland is going to raise the water level by 40 feet in 10 years. Hi. <laughs> Our craft is a service that should be used to make people's lives better, and especially those people who need us the most. Because make no mistake, the world is working exactly as it's designed to work. And if you want to change how it works, you have to change who's designing it. Now, if there's anybody here run a startup? Yeah, I see a few hands kind of being half raised, a little scared. I know that that might have been a little hard to hear. But in spite of all of the bad examples that I just mentioned, I do believe in startups. I do believe in the entrepreneurial spirit. I do believe there is good innovation that can come out of places like that. And just look at this fucking diversity. <laughs> yeah. And I want them to succeed. And I am doing you a favor by telling these kids not to come work for you. Do not go work at Sniffer. <laughs> for good ideas to succeed, Design needs to be integrated into them from the beginning. The, no amount of design is going to turn that chair into that chair. Yet this is how we've been designing the web for years. So I want you to hire designers. I want you to hire a lot of designers. But I want you to hire designers who can actually help you. That means that, means that you need to be looking for designers who understand the value, the business value, of what they do to both investors and the engineering team and to your users. That means you need to be des hiring designers who know what questions to ask. And it means that you need to be hiring the kind of designers who aren't afraid to throw a few elbows when an elbow needs to be thrown. And that means that you need a designer at the same level as your head of engineering, at the same level as your head of product, and at the same level as your head of business, all of them reporting to the most important person in the, co in, in the company, the customer. But you need a designer who's been around the block a few times. Somebody who knows how to integrate design into the heart of a company. Now, those designers are out there, and they're a little harder to find. You can, you can find them by praying to Our Lady of the Vesting Schedule, for one. <laughs> but they're battle-tested. These designers are Andy from the future. I am building them for you. When he's done with me, he's going to be so fucking awesome. And if you have one designer in your company, you need to make sure that that person has two very important character traits. One, you need to make sure she's a good leader. And two, you need to make sure she's a good teacher. She needs to be a good leader because she's going to be bringing design to the company and she's going to have to sell it, not just to your users and your investors, but internally as well. And that may actually be the hardest part of her job. And she's going to need your backup. I guarantee that within two days of hiring your designer, somebody's going to come into your office and say something like, Barbara isn't letting us launch because she says the sign-up flow sucks. And your reply needs to be, that is exactly why I hired Barbara. And if you hired right, you need to trust that when Barbara says the sign-up flow sucks, the sign-up flow sucks. 
And here's the really good news. You're also going to need this person to be a good teacher because once she establishes good design within your company, once she establishes that foothold and has started making design core to what you do and you start becoming successful, then you can start bringing in some young people for that designer to train. And that first designer gets to become a mentor and then you've got yourself an honest to goodness design practice. But building that kind of practice and doing that kind of nuanced bridge building and laying that kind of foundation needs to be done by somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. And if you put a kid in that position, you are not putting them in a position to succeed. And you're not putting your company in a position to succeed. Not to mention that you're destroying their career. Now, whatever you choose to do, however you decide to handle this moment, I wish you luck. I commend you on being a designer at this glorious time when design is seen as a force of change in the world. And I implore you to rise to that challenge. I hope you take to the task with the respect and joy that it, des that it deserves. I hope you do your work ethically and honorably. I challenge you to do the job well and to look out for the people who need you to do it well the most. And I implore you to act quickly. This is indeed a golden age of design. This is an opportunity that doesn't come along in every generation. And I beg you not to waste it. Thank you.